Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone at home. Welcome to GCBC Sunday service. We're really glad you're here. If you'd like to know more about GCBC, please contact us at GC, contact at gcbcny.org. We'd love to hear from you. Before we start, I'd like to open us in prayer. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all together. Please help focus all our minds on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now I'd like to hand it over to Raymond for worship. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear, bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am divine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my word remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be down for you. done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so that I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of God. Now I would like to invite Edmund to begin today's sermon. Hello, everybody. Just for the record, that's not my sermon title. I don't have one yet. So <laughs> um, I have to say, I was really impressed with the worship today. It really got to me. So uh, thank you, uh, Raymond and Michaela, for that. That was some really good worship. I know that uh, doing things in quarantine has been really hard. I know for me specifically, this sermon, like writing it in itself was a challenge. It took literally, I think, all my willpower just to sit down and really speak through words, uh, read God's word and speak through it. And, you know, I really have to give props to Pastor David because I think that it takes a lot of effort, guys. And so, you know, I want to also say good luck to Raymond and Simon who are going to be preaching in a few weeks. Uh, let me start us off in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray that all the words that I speak today are within your scope, Lord, that your spirit will enter me, Lord. Lord, I pray that you use me as a vessel. I pray that the words that are coming out of my mouth are the words that you want to speak to the congregation, Lord. I pray that nothing that I speak is not of your will. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So can we pull up the passage again really quickly? Um, John 15. Okay. Yeah. So John 15, there is a lot to dissect in this passage. There's a lot of words that have just a lot of power. And to be honest, when I was um, dissecting this passage, I actually read from the NSA, uh, NASB version. So there's going to be a lot of different, I guess, tweaks to when I speak and what's on the screen. So just bear with me on that. But I think first, understanding this passage, we really have to understand John as a gospel. So we're going to explore John as a gospel first. John is the fourth book of the gospel, and it's written, it's believed to be written by John the disciple. And what is the purpose of this book? What is the purpose of this gospel? Well, in John 20, if we can pull it up really quickly. Thank you. So in John 20, the purpose of John's, of John's gospel, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So now we know the purpose of this. We know the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of John, the gospel, is to convince non-believers that Jesus was actually a real person. 
you know, John believed that even people at his time wouldn't believe it. They saw miracles happen, but many didn't believe that Jesus was still son of man. Many believed that he wasn't there. Many believed that he wasn't going to resurrect. So the purpose of this gospel was to convince us and the readers, convince the readers that, yes, Jesus was a real person. And this passage is no exception to that. So when we're reading the passage as a whole, the first thing we see is that, oops, sorry, can we pull the passage again? Thank you, Herman. When we're reading the passage as a whole, the first thing we see that is that God is giving us life. We see in verses five and six, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and, and I in him, he bears much fruit. From, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into a fire and they are burned. I think when I was writing the sermon, my title wanted to be Abidance, to follow. Well, what does abidance really mean? Abidance is to wait, to remain in him. In another word, it also means to survive. When Jesus is telling us that, well, sorry, in here, Jesus is telling us that survival, that abidance is key to becoming a Christian. He tells us that for us Christians, survival is that we're directly linked in our abidance to Jesus. And then in this analogy to the vine, he tells us that, yes, we are made to follow. Let's dive a little deeper. I want to take a look into verse one. In my version, at least, it says, um, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So in here it says gardener, but I'm going to go off the word vine dresser. So in vine dresser, Obviously, none of us really know what that is. No one really has an occupation called vine dresser anymore, but we're going to explore that a little bit because I think it, mean, it has a lot of meaning that we need to explore. So vine dressers were usually, oh, thank you. Vine dressers were usually in charge of cultivating, pruning, and training vines. They had one primary job, and this was to make sure that the vines produced fruit. It was all about fruit. A vine didn't have fruit. It didn't mean anything to it. And so vine dressers had two jobs. One of the jobs was to prune, to cut off and to cut off dry and withered branches. This was off season. In winter, they would cut off and prune the, the, the branches that were dead. And also the second job they would have is in season, um, when they started budding, they would take off the smaller buds and so that the bigger buds can have all the nutrients. This way that the bigger buds will grow bigger and better than the smaller ones that would hinder it. When Jesus says that we are the branches and he is the vine dresser, he's telling us that God is watching over us in every season. He's telling us that God is ready and willing to tend to us, but we have to be able to, we have to be willing to accept it. God has given us a roadmap and he's, he's given us the roadmap because he's already given us Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the word. In verse three, you already, you already clean because of the word I've spoken into you. He's already given us an answer. Oh, not that yet. He's already given us an answer. He's already given us the word. He's already paved the path to perfection, but we just have to follow it. We just have to let the vine dresser be the vine dresser. It's really, whether, it's, really, it's really up to us whether or not to receive the full nourishment. Do we want to be the full bud? Do we want to receive all the nourishment that we need to survive? I'm going to show you a clip from one of my favorite movies. Um, for you basketball fans, it's uh, Coach Carter. Um, I'm a huge basketball fan myself, so um, this just really spoke to me. Um, so Coach Carter is about a coach who <clears throat> takes things a little differently. Instead of just trying to win a championship, he instead tries to teach his team to be better men. And um, a lot of the, movie, the clip will explain a lot of it, but this is when they're in a library and they're on probation because he's not letting them play because they're all in bad academic standing. And this is pretty common. You know, athletes generally don't have good grades. Not all of them, obviously, but generally their academic standing is not that good. They want to play sports. That's what happens. But Coach Carter wants to teach them better. And so we're just going to take a look at this clip. Oh, sorry. There's a little profanity in it. Just please look past it. It's for the purpose of it. Yes. Lights, Let's please. Take Thank you. take time to say whatever it is we want while the doors are closed. You have the floor. This is about us. Man, this shit ain't about us. This is all about Coach Carter. We're the basketball team. All I see is you on TV, getting famous, eating that shit up. That all you see? That's all I see. <clears throat> you ain't lying. Well, let me tell you what I see. I see a system 
that's designed for you to fail. Now, I know you all like stats, so let me give you some. Richmond High only graduates 50% of its students. And of those that do graduate, only 6% go to college. Which tells me when I walk down these halls and I look in your classrooms, maybe only one student is going to go to college. But damn, Coach Carter, if I ain't going to college, where am I going to go? Now, that's a great question. And the answer for young African-American men in here is this. Probably to prison. In this county, 33% of black males between 18 and 24 get arrested. So look at the guy on your left. Now look at the guy on your right. One of you is going to get arrested. Growing up here in Richmond, you're 80% more likely to go to prison than college. Those are the numbers. Those are some stats for your ass. Now I want you to go home, and look at your lives tonight, look at your parents' lives, and ask yourself, do I want better? If the answer is yes, I'll see you here tomorrow. And I promise you, I will do everything in my power to get you to college and to a better life. Thank you. Society is setting us Christians up for failure. I don't know about you guys, but I know for me, sometimes it's very hard to even share the gospel. People are so closed off about religion. You know, they say it's fake. They say it's only for people who need help or anything like that, right? Society is setting us up for failure. I'm going to give you some statistics now, just like Coach Carter did. This is from the Barna Group. It's an evangel evangelical Christian poll database. 35% of married men are stepping out of marriage by having a sexual affair. 79% of all males ages 18 to 30 are watching porn monthly. Now, one of the craziest things about that is that Christians are not excluded from that. In fact, actually, Christians follow the same statistics. Doesn't it sound crazy that us people who are supposed to reflect Christ are actually following the same statistics as everyone else? How are we supposed to get people to believe that we're, we're, we're reflecting Christ as people, but we're following the same statistics as everyone else? No one's going to look at us and be like, I want to be like you because you just know what you're doing. They're going to look at us and be like, nothing's different. Don't we, want to live, don't we want to live differently? As Coach Carter says in the clip, I will do everything in my power to get you to college and a better life. I think the same goes for God. God will do everything to provide us, me and you, a better life. We just have to show up. We just have to abide. First point was we have to, first point is that when we abide, we have a life. We have, a, we have a vine and we have a vine dresser to give us life. I'm going to bring us to our second point about abidance. Second point is that Jesus brings, when we have life, Jesus also gives us fruit. And this passage, fruit is mentioned many, many times. In verse 2, yeah, he, uh, in verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. In verses 7 and 8. Go to seven and eight, please. If you, if you remain in me, if you abide in me, sorry, abide and remain are, uh, I guess, the other word here. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father glorified by this, that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. God's telling us that he wants us to have an abundant life. He's not stopping any of us. He's laying out the line. He's saying, he's saying verse two, if you abide in me, I will give you fruit. Every branch will bear fruit and he will prune it. He will take care of us. He is a vine dresser. Now I want to go, I want to take a look into this a little more historically. So we're going to go into Isaiah 5 verses 1 to 7. This is the parable of the vineyard and I'm going to read it out for us. I'm going to read it out from uh, my version, if you guys can just follow along here. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. 
My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it only produced worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its walls, and it will be trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it, for the vineyard of the Lord of the host is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah and his delightful plant, thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. I think this parable just has a lot to discover. So God is obviously talking about a vineyard. What is this vineyard talking about? He's talking about Israel. Israel was God's original plan. If you guys know through all of the Old Testament, it was focused on Israel. God wanted, to, God wanted Israel to be the story. God wanted Israel to be the protagonist. But that didn't happen. Israel failed God. And this, this parable tells you all about it. Right? He, I will make it a wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated. Israel failed, guys. Israel was what God wanted. If we can go back to John, one, uh, John 15, please. Uh, verse 1. Now we're going to go back to I am the true vine. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, he intends to replace Israel as his focus. Instead of Israel being the focus, it's now Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was just about following the commandments. Now it's about following Jesus Christ. It's about being his faithful follower. God's, abun God's abundance was no longer appointed to Israel, but instead to the believers and the followers of Christ. When we follow God, he makes a plan for us. He made a plan for us. It's no longer Israel. It will be Israel in the future. But it is now in our hands to follow Jesus, the true vine. I want to bring us to our final point today, um, verse 11. I have told, I have told you... These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. We see in the previous 10 verses that joy is something that Jesus instills in us from our abidance in him, our following, our surviving in him and his commandments. The joy that God sees can only be seen as fatherly love and fulfillment. I'll tell you a little bit about my family just so we can be on the same page about fatherly love. Um, as many of you guys know, I'm, I'm Herman and Raymond's brother, so we share the same father. Um, but when my parents grew up, my parents were um, working immigrants with no college degree. Um, they came here and they worked hard hours. So a lot of the times they weren't there for us to, you know, just watch over us. It didn't mean they didn't care for us. It just meant that they showed love differently, you know. They showed love by getting us grapes every single second <laughs> or something like that, you know. They showed love in different ways. Um, my father specifically, he was a very, my father is a very, uh, I would say, hardworking man, but distant at times, you know, he's a, he comes home, he relaxes on the TV, and at times, you know, he, my parents never really cared about, you know, our academic work, our extracurriculars, or interests, because that's just not what, I guess, Asian parents do. Um, it didn't mean they didn't care for us, but it's just, they weren't interested. It, it's to the point where, <laughs> Um, during Thanksgiving, my dad actually asked me where I went to college, and I was like, Dad, <laughs> you pay for it. Come on. But, um, yeah, so one moment I always remember, or moments I always remember is when I come home for college every single break. Um, I always sit down to have dinner with my family, and my dad always tells me, in Chinese, obviously, he says, um, why, you got so big. Uh, I'm so proud of the man you become. You can just finally do what I'm not doing. And I'm like, you know what? I guess that's how God shows his love to us. And that's how my father showed my, his love to me. I think God has taken all the hardships, the ones we don't see and the ones that we do. And he smiles knowing that we'll find our way eventually. I think fulfillment comes from the moment our father in heaven tells us that he is proud. 
and that we have been good and faithful servants. When we abide, we abide in the word. When we abide, we abide in the truth, which is Jesus. And that leads to fulfillment and joy in the Father. I think one of the greatest things I've ever known is that God is always waiting for us. He's always waiting for us no matter what we do. And there's many instances of this parable of the lost son where um, the second son comes, comes home after squandering all his parents' inheritance and his father still accepts him. It's crazy. Or, you know, the parable of the lost sheep where God, Jesus, the shepherd, still goes and looks for that one sheep, even though he has 99. He still cares for every single one of us. He still has a plan for all of us. I'm going to end with this, uh, this clip. It's from a very popular cartoon that my generation grew up with. And I'm going to explain the clip really quickly. In the scene, the nephew and his father um, were fugitives in their homeland. And the nephew turned his uncle in in hopes that his honor and status would be restored. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a powerful image. So let's, let's roll it. Thank you. Uncle, I know you must have mixed feelings about seeing me, but I want you to know, I am so, so sorry, Uncle. I am so sorry and ashamed of what I did. I don't know how I can ever make it up to you. But I... How can you forgive me so easily? I thought you would be furious with me. I was never angry with you. I was sad because I was afraid you lost your way. Don't lose your way! Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're just going to take that part where um, the uncle says, I was just afraid you lost your way, right? I think that really captures... Um, unconditional love right where god says i was just afraid you lost your way i wasn't ashamed of what you did and in the scene uh, the nephew jailed his uncle even though they they left the country together and they went through years of running from the government he still turned him in but the uncle had no hate in his heart he was just afraid he lost his way god tells us that <clears throat> Even if, we lost our, even if we lose our way, there's still a way coming back. Prodigal son, we have a way. So, abidance, following, surviving, lets us lead a life worthy of calling God our Savior. Abidance in the truth, in Jesus, the true vine, lets us lead a life full of abundance and joy. Abidance brings us back to God. Abidance, abidance is a life Abidance is abundance in that life. And abidance is joy in that life. Let me end this off in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks that you are the true vine, Lord. Lord, we give thanks that you, you are just always waiting for us no matter what. Lord, we know that no matter how many hardships you take, you are always willing. And Lord, we thank you for that so much, Lord. Lord, we just give thanks. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us this week. Here are some exciting announcements. Uh, if you guys want to give offering, the link is gcbcny.org slash give. Sermons will be available on YouTube every Monday. And the annual retreat has been moved to Memorial Day weekend next year. So our church has started up a Chinese English volunteer group. If you would like to help, please contact Herman or Karen if you're interested. A youth group and college fellowship are at Friday, 8 p.m., led by Herman and Cameron. This is this week's schedule, and Wednesday has a joint prayer meeting if you want to join. And this is the prayer list if you guys want to keep this in your prayer. Well, that concludes this week. Uh, after a moment of silent prayer, you're dismissed.